the end of week two. It's good to see all of you today. We are almost 20% done with the quarter already. Isn't that crazy? I just can't believe it. It's like, I went to a school with semesters, you know? You started in August, and you went until the day before Christmas or something, and you learned things. You didn't just <laughs> stick around for 10 weeks. Oh, well, whatever. Um, we are going to learn about more collections today. Specifically, we're going to learn about sets and maps. And uh, your homework one is due tonight at six. Uh, homework two goes out today. I think it appeared magically on the website like 10 minutes ago. It's there. Uh, the, uh, I, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about the homework, but um, uh, the, just, just so you know, the assignment two has three parts. Part A is called word ladder. Part B is called uh, N grams. And part C is called maze generator. And uh, just for reference, if you're taking 106B, you have to do this part and that part, but you don't have to do the maze generator. That's the X part, just in terms of gauging the difference between the two courses. So yeah, that's going to go out today. It's due a week from today. This is the sort of punishing regimen that you suckers all signed up for. Um, so go check that out over this weekend. The assignment focuses on collections. You guys just had your first section. I guess a few of you probably have it after class today, but you're having your first uh, sections. Homework two is a pair assignment. If you want, you can work with a buddy, optionally. Um, if you work with a buddy, uh, you have to be in the same section as your buddy. If you aren't in the same section as the person you want to work with, you can swap sections. You can go to the CS198 website and you can click a link for swapping sections. And if you're not able to swap, you can contact our head TA, Amy, and she can help you uh, resolve your, your difference, okay? So just be mindful of that if you want to work with a partner. Uh, I will point out, if you do work with a partner, a very tempting strategy would be to divide these up and have like you do part A and I'll do part B and so on. And I mean, I don't really think you should do that. That's not really what I had in mind. I had more in mind that you'd work together on all of it. Um, but hey, I can't follow you around. I can't spy on you yet. Uh, cell phone technology is not there yet. So I can't force you to have a certain working style. But I will say that uh, if you don't do all these problems, you know, you might not have practiced some of these structures. And then on the test, you might be less prepared. So I think you're sort of, uh, you're doing yourself a disservice if you're unfamiliar with some of these problems. Um, anyway, that's, that's for you guys to think about. If you do want to work with a partner, I would suggest reading this link here that says pair programming. It has some discussion of our policies what you should or shouldn't do, kind of how to do it, or whatever. Um, take a look there. I bet that would answer most of the questions you might have about working in pairs, OK? Uh, yeah, that's all I wanted to really say about that. So uh, let's talk about sets and maps and stuff today. Let me open up my slides for today. Again, this comes from chapter five. This has been basically all chapter five this week. So what's a set? Well, it's a collection that has unique values, no duplicates. A set is generally built to optimize its behavior around a certain small set of operations. And those operations are adding and removing elements and then searching for elements or testing for membership, asking is this in the set or not. That's mostly all that a set can do. And uh, we saw an idea on Wednesday that sometimes if a collection has fewer operations, then maybe it will be able to implement them really efficiently. And that was what we saw with stacks and queues. Um, and that's also going to be the case here. You can also add and remove and search for things in a vector or a linked list, but it won't do it as quickly as this thing will. Hopefully, I can show you that in a minute. So uh, <clears throat> one of the main things that you give up when you have a set is you give up the notion of indexes and um, insertion order. So if you add three elements, you shouldn't count on where they will be, what order they will be in the set. In fact, we don't even really think of a set as having an order, usually. That's why, oops, system problem detected. Oops, never mind that. Um, hopefully my computer doesn't crash today. Um, so when I draw pictures of sets, I usually just draw them as these amorphous blobs or circles or something where all the elements are kind of scattered around in there. Because again, I want to break you out of this mindset that like this is the first element and this is the second element. Like we don't really care about that if we're using a set. If you care so much about order, then use a vector or something. 
So, uh, you know, you ask it if it contains two, it does. You ask it if it contains the word B, it doesn't. So, system problem detected. Thanks. <laughs> if you keep canceling them, eventually they go away, right? Just like child childhood trauma, same thing. Just press cancel. It'll be fine. Um, so, yeah, that's what a set is. That's what a set conceptually is. <clears throat> so, okay, here's an example of a problem where you might use a set. Write code that counts the number of unique words in a large text file. So read the file in and figure out how many unique words. So if you see the word like hello twice, you should only count that as one, right? If you see the word the 55 times, you should just count that as one word. So of course what I'm trying to say here is that a set of words would be great, right? But I really want to drive home the point that a set is better for some tasks than a vector. So I want to start out by implementing this the wrong way using a vector, okay? So let's do that. I've got a cute creator project. It's on the web page if you want. I want to write a method called word count. You pass a file name and I'll tell you how many unique words are in the file. For now, let's use a vector. So I did the part that doesn't have anything to do with sets or vectors. So um, I open this file and then I have a loop that reads words from the file. And then as I read each word, I just, I lowercase it because I just don't want to deal with capitalization issues, you know, capital hello versus lowercase hello. So now um, it says to do. So let's make a vector of the words. And again, this is the wrong implementation, vector of string words, okay. And now here I'll just say words.add words, words.add word. That's not quite right, is it? What am I missing in this uh, part of the code here? Check if it's there already. I shouldn't add the same word twice, right? Okay, so how do I see if it's already there? Like if the vector contains or something. So okay, if words dot contain. There's no contains method. That's weird. Dot find. There's no find. Huh. Well, who designed this dumb vector? Whoever did it must have made a big oversight and forgotten to include a method to search a vector for a word. Well, that's okay. Um, I want to help us out. I have written a method function <laughs> called contains. You pass a vector and you pass a string and it'll tell you if that string is in the vector. So we can look at how I wrote that in a minute. I'm really good at programming. So um, <laughs> if contains words comma word, or I guess if it doesn't contain, right, then add it to the list, okay? So if we assume that my magical function works, then that would be good. Okay, so now, when we're done, it says int count of words equals zero, but it's not count, right? How many words are in the file? How do I know the number of unique words in the file? The size of the vector words dot size, right? Okay, and then just that how many unique words it takes. Okay, so I'll compile and I'll run it. And so, you know, how's everybody's week? How's everybody <laughs> doing? Um, hmm. So I, my wife and I just recently discovered we really like this show, Rick and Morty. It's pretty fun. Cartoon. Yeah. And we, I, don't, I don't know anything about the plot or the anything, so we've just been watching through it. And last night we get to this episode called Pickle Rick. Oh. And it's like the whole episode, he's a pickle. And he's trying to, you know, he's getting eaten by cockroaches and birds, and he's baking in the sun. And it's like, this guy's a pickle for the whole episode, and it was just the most zany thing. We had a really, really cool time watching it. And, I really think it's one of my favorite new cartoon shows that, oh, it's not, okay. Um, <laughs> okay, so there's 30,000 30, words. Um, it took 42 seconds. I had to kill a little bit of time there talking about my interesting personal life. Um, now, it's not, that seems like that's kind of a bad runtime, right? But I don't know, is it? I mean, maybe that's just how long it takes. Maybe this is just a really computationally intensive task that just takes a long time to perform, right? Any thoughts, why do you think it takes so long? What is it doing that's so slow when it's running this code here? Uh, let's see, who have I not heard from? In the back, yeah. So the method you wrote contains has to iterate over all of the elements of words. Uh, so it's O of N in the size of words. So as you reach adding, um, as you reach the end um, of, of all of the words you're checking, it will take longer and longer and longer, and then um, and then and then that's why it takes uh, that long. 
Yeah, I think that's the right idea. Um, although, I have to say I'm a little offended. It sounds like you're implying that I didn't write this function very well. <laughs> and you know I don't take criticism very kindly. So let's, you said you think that my function looks through the vector. So let's look. Here's what the function does. For, for each string in the vector, if that element is the string I'm looking for, then yes, I contain that word. And otherwise, if I get to the end, I say false, right? So that's called a linear search. Just look through the vector for the word, right? So every time you go to look, every time you read a word from the file, I have to call that function. So every single word, I walk through the whole vector, right? Now, you might say, oh, Marty, your implementation is dumb. You should do this or you should do that or whatever. But I'm just saying, like, that's typically how a vector would be used to solve this problem. It took us about 42 seconds to solve it, right? OK, well, um, there is another way. And that way is to use the set structure. There's, a, um, there's two kinds of sets in C++ in our library. One's called a set and one's called a hash set. I'll talk about the difference in a minute. Um, in fact, don't even read this yet. There's a structure called set. <laughs> if, you, if you include set.h, you get a collection that has these methods, add, uh, remove, and contain. So those are the three main ones. It also has is empty in size and clear, and you can print it with a less than, less than, but that's kind of standard stuff. So look, let me just spoil the, the, um, the good times here, the, the, the solution to this here. So if I go up here, instead of a vector of strings, if I make a set of strings, do I import the set library? Yeah, I did. Okay, so um, I use a set of strings, and I compile that. It doesn't like this line of code anymore because this function asks for a vector parameter, and this isn't a vector. So if I just change it, the set collection actually has a contains method. So now I can just ask the set to do that. So remember, it took 42 seconds before. And OK, it took 300 milliseconds that time. So that, that is better. <laughs> but how will we hear about your Rick and Morty answers? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm going to have to tell you about Pickle Rick another time, I guess. Uh, that's the thing. Sets give you a little less of a break. If you like taking a break, maybe you're more of a vector type of a person. Um, it's a lot faster, right? So I, mean, I hope that that, that uh, demo kind of illustrates this big difference of these two in this particular sort of a task. Now, I've stacked the deck. I picked a problem that set was going to be really good for. But there are lots of problems like this. So let me back up for a second, because I said that there was a slide I kind of skipped over. There's two kinds of sets in our library. Remember what I taught you before about um, how there's more than one way to implement the same operations? I had a term for that, do you remember? Redundancy. Not redundancy. <laughs> uh, I called it ADT. I heard somebody say that. Abstract data type. Yeah, there's kind of two collections that have the same operations. There's one called set, there's one called hash set. If you're a Java person, there's one called tree set and one called hash set um, so that's similar. So. <clears throat> The difference between these two is that there are different implementation internally. The regular one called set is built using a structure called a binary search tree. We will learn about that later. Um, it's pretty fast. It stores its elements in a sorted order, like alphabetical order or numerical order or something like that. Uh, the other one is called a hash set. It's built using an array, but the array is being used in a special way. We call it a hash table. I'm going to talk about that later in the course also. The ordering of a hash set is a little bit unpredictable and hard to understand, but it's a little bit faster than a regular set. Um, so I guess if you're curious, I, what did it take 300 some milliseconds before? If I say hash set here and I run it, it takes even less time, slightly, uh, a little bit less than the regular set. So um, OK, so there's two sets. You might say, well, the hash one is the better one, right? But I think this order issue kind of comes up. Because sometimes you want to concern yourself with order, and sometimes you don't. So you might s sacrifice a little bit of speed to get the sorted ordering of, of uh, this one. Yeah? Do you still need the contains operation if you're using the set? That's a good question. Um, here in the code, I'm saying if the word set does not contain this word, then add the word. But actually, I didn't spend a lot of time on the slide, but the, the adding method of a set it will not permit a duplicate. So if you try to add a duplicate, it will silently just ignore it. So I can just say words.add word without fear of damaging the data. I don't think we'll see a difference really in the runtime. It doesn't take very long to call contains on a set. But I, well, I did save a few milliseconds, so I trimmed that runtime down just a little bit more. So yeah, you were totally right about that. Uh, question, Richard, yeah. So uh, how do you access this how do you access the sorted? Oh, I'll show you in a minute. Uh, you can do a for each loop over uh, a set. 
I would say for many situations, we don't care much about the ordering. For many situations, we just want to test for membership and we don't want to like loop over the set, but it depends what we're doing. Question? Uh, we saw that the hash set implementation was a bit faster than the set implementation. So is the hash set faster by a constant term or is it by some, is it basically some other exponential form? Oh yeah, good. his question was kind of about the big, oh, like what factor of difference is the speed uh, change here? Here's a more specific answer. Most of the methods of the, the regular set have a log n runtime. And most of the methods of the hash set have a constant runtime. And it's probably not very clear why that would be the case. Uh, here's my one sentence version and I will write you an IOU for a better explanation in a few weeks when we crack these open and re-implement them ourselves. This set kind of divides its uh, elements into this thing called a binary tree where it keeps splitting, splitting, splitting in half. And when it searches, it sort of goes left, goes right, goes down one of these halves or the other. And so it's constantly like dividing the search space in half to find things. And when you're constantly dividing or multiplying by two until you get to an endpoint, that tends to be what we call a logarithmic behavior, log base two behavior. Um, the hash set has magic inside. It has a magic <laughs> lookup function where you say, hey, string, are you in the set? And it said is really a big array. And the magical uh, hash function algorithm says, well, if I am in the set, I would be in index number 1875. And so it jumps to that index and says, are you there? Yes, no, and that's all it does. So hash sets, again, I will explain this better later, hash sets have magic algorithms that sort things into very specific locations and have fast lookups for those locations. It's a really cool algorithm. I will teach you about it later. For now, I just want you to understand kind of what these do when you use them, how to be an intelligent client of these structures. Um, so add, remove, contains. That's basically what you get. They're both really fast. I think when I was a student and I learned about this equivalent kind of thing, but, you know, it was on a stone tablet instead of a projector back then, but uh, that was 1999. So uh, when I learned about this, I was like, oh, dude, big old what? Totally better. Log n. Ew, gross. That sucks. <laughs> but like. Log base two of a number is not very much. Like, you know, remember, this is like how expensive, how slow the thing is, how fast it grows. So like, what's the log base two of a thousand? It's roughly 10 or nine, it's, it's uh, two to the 10th is 1,024. So if you have a thousand elements, it has to look at like 10 of them. What's the log base two of a million? It's a thousand times a thousand, two to the 10th times two to the 10th, two to the 20. So if you have a million elements in a set, the set has to examine 20 of them. That's not so bad. If you have a billion elements, 30, trillion elements, 40, it's not that bad. Log n is not that bad. Don't worry about it. These are both very fast. Okay, so those are the two kinds of sets in our library. There are equivalent structures in the um, STL that comes with C++. I'm not going to teach you those today. Um, sets also support operators. C++ has this cool feature called operator overloading where you can describe operators for a data type if you want to. So you can actually... Um, not only can you ask whether two sets are equal, which will tell you if they have the same elements as each other, disregarding order, doesn't care about order. Um, you can also do unions, intersections, and differences using operators. You know, uh, you know, union, you take the elements that are in either one or both, combine them together. Intersection, you keep only the elements that are in both of them. Differences, you, you have set A and you difference it with B, which ex takes out of A anything that was in B. I don't know, all that kind of stuff. So, Set, standard uh, set operations work using these operators. There are also method versions of these. I think there's a dot union method and a dot intersection method and so forth. Yeah. Are these union and uh, intersection operators only for the Stanford local library or also for the SDL? Uh, I believe these are Stanford only. Uh, there are ways of doing these kind of operations with the STL, but I think the syntax is a little bit different. I, 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 frankly, I. I don't remember exactly what operators the STL sets support. I think they support some of these, but I don't remember exactly which ones. If you want to know, the doc link is on the webpage. You can look them up. Um, so, so like sometimes we'll use plus equals. You can have a set and you can say plus equals an element or plus equals another set and it'll merge in an element or merge in all the elements of that set. So if I ever write plus equals, that's just like calling dot add, basically. Yeah. Can one of them be a hash set and the other be a regular set? Or yeah, good question. Can you add a hash set to a set? I think you can. I mean, I should know this because I wrote half of the dumb thing, but um, I, you know, you forget. If when you're old, you, your brain starts to turn into mashed potatoes. So, um, I mean, look, if I have a, a set of strings called hi, and then I do words dot add all hi, it, 
is there one that takes it? I think it works. Uh, no, it doesn't like that. Um, yeah, I don't think it works. I guess I guess the, the dummy who wrote this didn't make those work together. Yeah, you, you know, one thing that you'll find that's a little different from a language like Java or something, Java has pretty good interoperation of different kinds of collections. And I think C++ is sort of like everybody's got their own moat around their castle, and they don't play together that well. But, um, you know, there's things you could do. You could do for each loop in the other set, add to the first set, something like that. Um, okay, anyway. Uh, you asked about the ordering issue. So the main place the ordering comes up is either if you print the set, it'll print out in a certain order, like a C out, or if you do a for each loop over the set. That's the main way. If you needed to loop over a set, you can't use the int i equals zero to size where you use bracket i. That doesn't work on a set, no indexes. But if you do a for each loop, it'll spit out each of the elements for you. Um, in terms of what order they come out, if it's a regular set, they come out in alphabetical order or numerical order. If it's a cache set, they'll just be kind of jumbled up into a random order. And you shouldn't count on any particular ordering. In fact, it might be different between two different runs of the program. So it depends on memory addresses and other things. So um, yeah. So this one, actually, there's supposed to be an X around that. Oh, there it is. That doesn't work. <laughs> there. OK. All right. Um, Here's an exercise. I want to skip it. If you want to do it, go ahead. Uh, there's a, this is you, this on our step-by-step -step, uh, site. Basically, you can use sets to keep track of numbers you've seen before, and you're trying to find a happy number where you sum the, the digits. Uh, I, I'm going to skip it because I don't have enough time. But go do that on step-by-step -step if you want, or do it on, the, on Qt Creator if you want. Um, so wait, what else? I'm doing structs here. So let's talk about structs. Uh, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. but. C++ allows you to create new types. You know, in Java, you can make a new class. Most languages, you can make a new class or a new object or something like that. Uh, C++ has classes. Their syntax is sort of icky, and so I don't want to talk about them yet. But you can do a lot of the same kind of stuff with a C++ class that you can do with a Java class or a Python class or whatever. Um, C++ also has a similar thing called a structure or a struct. A struct is basically a class, but it's typically only used to store a couple of variables. It's a class that just stores data, usually. It can do more, but it mostly is used in this way. So if you make a struct called date, and you store a month and a day in there, this is a template for a new data type. And each date object you create has a month and a day stored inside of it. This is a class with no constructor and no methods, but just two instance variables or two fields. So now you can say date today, and you can set its month to 7, or its date 13. Or you can create it with brackets, and the values in the brackets will be used to initialize the two, the two fields. Um, so I mean, why am I showing you this? I, it doesn't really fit with what we're talking about right now. But I think one thing that's kind of interesting is when you try to put structures into a collection, like a set. Uh, oh, you have a question. Go ahead. Yeah. Um Indexable, like, oh, the month is bracket zero or something? Yeah, given that, like, list No, it doesn't support indexes. This syntax is just special initializer syntax. If you okay. put values in curly braces, C++ in the 11th edition, 2011 edition, they added what they call the universal initializer syntax, which means you can initialize almost anything by putting curly braces and then writing out the values that constitute that thing's data in order, in the order they're declared, with commas between them. So that's why vectors let you do that, and structs, and just any kind of thing, almost any kind of thing now can be initialized in that way, which is a nice step up for the language. So um, the reason I'm showing you this, again, I think it feels like I just took a swerve in the middle of the lecture here. But if you wanted to make a set of dates, like, oh, these are the important dates on my calendar or whatever. So imagine I had a class struct date. And in here, I have int month and I have int day. I mean, you could have whatever. You could have int year. You could have as many fields as you want. But now in here, if I made you know date uh, Xmas twelve twenty five, and then I said date B day, my birthday is nine nineteen. Uh, then you know, if you just make those date objects, that's underlining them because I'm not using them yet. But if I said I want to make a set of dates uh, calendar. And then I did calendar.add xmas and calendar.add bday. I would get a strange error. It says blah, 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 blah. No match for operator less than operand types are const date const date. 
This is a great example of C++ compiler errors are hard to understand sometimes. Uh, the, the human explanation of what's happening here is that a set, I told you before, that a set likes to sort its elements in order and a hash set jumbles them into unpredictable order. So when you say you want a set of base and you want to add these two, the set is trying to figure out like how do I sort them? And you might say, well, it's obvious September comes before Christmas, or but the C++ doesn't understand that yet. So in order for a data type to be able to be put into a set, you have to write something called an operator less than function <laughs> that takes a date and a date and tells you whether the first one is less than the second one or not. And this allows the set to understand how to compare them for order. This is an example of something called operator overloading. What I'm doing, I don't know if the syntax is really mysterious, but I'm saying I want to define new operator usage of the less than operator. It's going to return a boolean because less than is always a logical operator. And the arguments on the two sides of the less than are going to be a date and a date. Although I'm writing them in as references to dates so they don't copy over. And const references because I'm not going to change them. Uh, yes? Can you make your own operator this way? Like they use the at symbol or something? You can, there's a list of operators that you're allowed to overload. I don't remember exactly what's on it, but it's a frighteningly large list. You can override like what a comma does. And it's quite fun. You can override plus to do subtraction. And so like when your friend sneaks away and they're not at the computer, he he he, define, you know. And then they're like, what the fuck? One plus one keeps giving me zero. What is this? It's so fucked up. And it's great. It's C++ pranks, uh, yeah. Could I make it not return a boolean? I don't know what happened. I think you have to follow the syntax header of the operator. I don't know if it lets you, I mean, C++ lets you do some awful, awful things, you know, but you shouldn't always do them. Uh, just to show you real quickly, I see there's another hand up, one or two, but just real quickly, if I say bool operator less than const date reference date one, const date reference date two, how do you know if date one is less than date two? Well whether date one's month is strictly less than date two's month, or uh, if the months are equal, uh, and day one's day is less than day two's day. That, those would be the conditions under which day one would be less than day two, right? So uh, that's a less than operator. Now what I'm hoping for is that my set will allow me to store these things. Dates are uh, calendar end all. It didn't compile. Oh, oh because uh, now it doesn't know how to print a date because it has no less than less than operator for a date. So if you want to do that, that's oh god, I don't want to talk about this. Uh, uh, operator less than less than that takes a const date reference d and it. Uh, oh wait, you have to pass an output stream out. Oh god, this is horrible. Out uh, <laughs> d dot month slash d dot day return out. Okay, gosh. Uh, ugh, never. No, we'll talk about that some other time. But if you want to make something printable, you have to override what the alligator operator does with that type. Eh, never mind. So. I run this and it says dates are Christmas and birthday and Christmas. Yay. So all that. Anyway, I didn't really want to teach you about that. I guess the reason I mentioned that, oops, where did it go? Oh no, I closed it. Sorry. The reason I showed you that is because it's pretty common that um, once you start using sets, you want to store your own kind of stuff in a set and then you get these weird errors and I wanted you to understand why and what's going on and how to fix it. Yeah. What about strings? How does it store strings? It stores strings. Strings are fine. You don't have to do this stuff for strings. Uh, it sorts them by ASCII ordering, which is basically alphabetical, but it's case sensitive. Another question. Yeah, Teal, sure. Um, the, do the overloaded operators have to live in the same file as the Oh, do they have to live in the same file? No, they follow the same rules as like other files where you can include other files and then they'll see the, the operators and stuff. Yeah, I haven't spoken much about, about multiple file programs, but yeah, that would be what you would do. In the back. So it seems that there is no such thing as a default yeah, unfortunately, it doesn't know what to do unless you tell it. You wish it would just look at the months and then look at the days, but I think, frankly, I think that might cause more bugs than it's solved because you'd say, oh, it's doing the wrong order. I don't know. Like, it, it doesn't, it doesn't want to make an assumption. It makes you tell it what to do. 
And frankly, the syntax for writing classes in C++ sucks because you have to do all this. Just to even get going where it works for basic stuff, you have to do this kind of crap. And this was one of the first OO languages. And they honestly fucked it up. <laughs> and so people like Java and Python, they learned and they made it better. And so this is kind of a cautionary tale of how to sort of not quite get an OO language right. Yeah, Richard. So uh, what's the best practice for like, I guess, packaging like this drop and then also those operators together? Oh, oh yeah. I, I want to mostly punt on your question. You're asking like if I was going to write a new struct, like how do I package it up and distribute it and stuff? like. You'd have a date.h and a date.cpp, and you'd have a lot of these things there. My file would include the, the h file, and I'll teach you more about multi-file programs pretty soon. But, but yeah, this is kind of just a quick hack example just to play with the syntax a little bit. Yeah. Why does the uh, output operator, why does it return the O stream? Oh, why does this return the O stream? I kind of don't want to talk about it. Basically, it just, this is so that I can chain these less than operators when I write out less than that that expression returns out, so I can use out for the next less than less than and chain them together. It's, it's a quirk of the syntax to allow multiple less than less than's in the same one. Okay, I wanna keep moving, but that's a little quirk of structs when used with sets. So wait, where was I? Uh, here, okay. So uh, I'm not really gonna spend any time on this at all, but there's another collection called a lexicon in our library. A lexicon is basically the same thing as a dictionary, but it doesn't have definitions. It's just a set of legal words in a vocabulary or a language. Um, it's basically, a lexicon is a set of strings. So when you declare a lexicon, you don't say lexicon bracket string, you just say lexicon. It's assumed to store strings. What you find is that it has almost exactly the same methods as a set. Add, remove, contains, to string. One difference is that it has a few convenience methods for like reading from a file and stuff. It also has some methods related to prefixes of words. So like, you could say, is there any word in the lexicon that starts with these letters? And it'll tell you that. Why does this have that? Well, it's got a different implementation on the inside that's useful for that kind of query called a prefix tree. Uh, I'm gonna teach you about it later. I only mention it right now because uh, it's, we're doing collections today. <laughs> we're gonna use this collection later for an assignment called Boggle where we're searching for partial words on a board, and this will be useful for that. They don't really need it right now, but it's basically a set of strings. We'll come back to it more later. Yeah? Is it also sorted by ASCII? Uh, the lexicon is alphabetically sorted. Yeah, if you printed it out, it would print the words in sorted order. Yep. Uh, okay, okay, I'm gonna move on. I wanna get to maps. Maps are important. Maps are also in chapter five. My guess would be that most of you have seen hash maps or some kind of maps before in other languages. They're sometimes called dictionaries like Python. Um, maps store pairs. So unlike all of the other collections we saw so far, a map does not just, you don't just add a value to a map. You have to add a pair of things to the map. The pair that you add is called a key and a value. You add those, that pair into the map together and then later, if you only have the key, you can ask the map to go find the associated value. So a classic example of maps is a dictionary or a phone book. You store pairs like Marty's phone number is this and Cynthia's phone number is that. So the name and the phone number are the pair of values that you store. Then later, like you, after you build the structure of data, later all you have is the name. Hey, what's Marty's phone number? And you tell it, I want the phone number for Marty and it goes and looks up the value that's associated with Marty and it returns it out to you. So it's a lookup structure. Find half of a pair using the other half. Uh, it's a one-way lookup. If you want the person's name, you, have the, you ever get this phone call from a random number, you don't know who it is, you wanna know who the person's name is? Well, a map doesn't go that direction. If you stored it with the, the names on the left and the numbers on the right, then it doesn't allow you to get from a phone number to a name. It only allows you to get from a name to a phone number uh, and so on. You guys have probably seen these before. Um, lots of real world examples. I think maps are one of the most useful data structures to be familiar with. Uh, so <clears throat> here's some of the core operations you can do with maps. You can put a key value pair in. This is like adding. Our library also allows you to use the square bracket syntax. This is kind of cool. Put Eric comma that number is the same as saying bracket Eric equals that phone number. This is the same the equivalent syntax. So actually it's kind of cool. I, I think one way you could think of a map is it's kind of like an array, 
but the indexes don't have to be ints that start at zero. The indexes could be strings, they could be booleans, they could be doubles, they could be anything. And I don't know, some people like thinking of it like that, some people don't, but you store it at the index of Eric, you store the value of that. So then later you can say, what is stored at the index Eric, and it'll tell you his phone number, I don't know. Um, if you try to put in a duplicate, it'll replace the previous value. Uh, you can get out the value for a key. Uh, you basically are saying, please find me the value that was associated with that key. You can also use the square bracket syntax for that. So get me the phone number for Yana. That's my wife's name. Um, you'll notice, in the, I don't know if you can see this far down, but I have the same phone number as my wife, Yana, here. It's okay to have a duplicate value in the map. It's not okay to have a duplicate key. If you try to add another entry with the name Marty, it'll replace that previous entry, okay? And so you can put, you can get, and you can remove. So yeah, uh, add, remove, and look up. Those are kind of the three operations you need from a map, yeah. So as far as the map goes, do all the keys have to be of the same type? Or, or and do all the values have to be of the same type? The yeah, uh, all the keys are the same type as each other. All the values are the same type as each other, but the keys can be a different type from the values. So you can map from strings to ints or from doubles to cares or whatever you want, yeah. So yeah, I mean, again, like I said, you store pairs and then later you have half the pair and you want the other half out again. I think some people have a little trouble, you guys probably get it, but some people have a little trouble understanding the idea here. Like, you know, if I have the whole pair here, why would I not have the whole pair down here? Why do I need to look this thing up? I just had it. Well, how did I forget it? Well, it's usually you read it in from a file. Maybe the program sits there prompting for a long time. You know, like you have the data, it just you, you don't know where that piece of data is or something like that. It's for a long lived process. Um, I also, I didn't necessarily say this, but it's implied that this structure should be built in such a way to do these operations quickly. It should be able to put and remove and get things very fast. And it does. So guess what? Uh, in our library, there's a class called math that stores things in sorted order, hmm. And there's a thing called hash math that stores things in an unpredictable order, hmm. That sounds familiar. So it's just like the sets, right? The same two <clears throat> types. And that's because literally the sets are implemented as a map from values to booleans of true. <laughs> that, yes, it's here, true. <laughs> so they're, they're basically the same as each other in a certain sense on the inside. Um, and the same sort of logic applies. If you care about the sort of sorting and ordering of the data, you would use a regular map. And if you don't care about that and you want a little bit more speed, you would use a hash map. And those things about storing dates or whatever, that would also apply if you were trying to store dates as keys in a map uh, as well. Yeah? Can the keys in a map be of the structure type? Mm-hmm. And then you have to type Yeah, the, the keys can be a struct, but then they have to have a sorting order. They have to have a less than operation. Yeah? So is it a struct? Was it a, like, a, how do you override the hash? Oh, how do you write a hash code? I'll teach you about it later, but in our library, you literally write a function, just a regular function called hash code that takes your type as a parameter and returns an int. And that int is to indicate a placement index where to put the thing in an array, basically. It's a little more to it than that, but that's the basic idea. If you're curious, open hashcode.h in the library, the Stanford library. What is an unpredictable order? Does that prevent you from bringing a 482 loop? Or is it just that 482 would just be unpredictable? Yeah, this unpredictable ordering, both for a set and for a map, if you do a for each loop over the map, you don't know what order the pairs will be given to you, but you will get all of them exactly once. So you could loop over it, you just have to not be concerned with which one you see first and which one you see second and so forth. If you care a lot about that, you could use a regular map for that. Bless you. So uh, here are the methods. I already showed you the most important ones. Put and get, there's also contains. There's also remove, there's some of the sort of standard stuff like is empty, all, you're getting used to some of these methods by now. The runtime here is exactly analogous to the regular set and the hash set. I think if you compared the two tables, you would find that they were almost the same as each other. Log for the regular map, O of one for the hash map, slightly faster. Okay. Um, if you want to loop over a map, that was what you were asking about. Make a map with some data inside. And then when you loop over it, what you're actually looping over is the keys, the left halves of the pairs. If you want the right halves, the values, you just look up the value for each key as you read it. So that's kind of the way to print the pairs. So I think this would say, uh, 
Berkeley students GPA is zero, and then it would say Marty's GPA is 2.7, and then it would say Victoria's GPA is 3.98. It would do that order because it's a regular map, so it's uh, sorted by the, the strings, the alphabetical order of the keys, right? Okay. Cool. Um, so yeah, another thing you can do with maps is you can use them to tally or count things. This is a useful example. Um, basically, if you, if you had like an election, let's say, not to get political, but you had an election and you had votes, and this is how the voting machine stores the votes. It's just as a big string. If they type R, that's a vote for the Republican. If they type D, it's a vote for a Democrat. If they vote type I, they threw their vote away. Um, <laughs> 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 votes each candidate got. I guess you could say that the R candidate is zero and the D candidate is one, but you're basically coming up with some kind of mapping from strings to ints in a vector or something. You could do that. But I think the idea of a map is you just say, hey, store 16 with the key of R and store 14 with the key of D. And you could actually increment those counts up over time. As you see a vote, you could go to that pair and increase its value by one and sort of accumulate these counts over time. So this idea, I want to visit this for a second with uh, we going back to counting words. So like we have a big book, and instead of just telling me how many words are in the book, I want to know for a given word, how many times does that word occur in the book? So you can ask me like the word the. I'll say, oh, the word the occurs 500 times in Moby Dick or whatever. Do you understand? So how do you do it? How does a map solve that problem? Like, what is the data type of the map, and what am I going to do with it? Uh, dark blue, sure. Yeah. yeah. So um, the, the key type is string, and the value type is in, and then all the strings are just all the unique words that you have. And if it's already in it, then you just take the Cool. OK. He said it's a map from strings to ints. And the strings are the words, and the ints are the count of how many times I've seen that word before. So yeah, that sounds great. I think that's a great idea. Um, let's. Uh, go to another file called maps.cpp. I basically have this ready to go, except that I don't have the map parts. So I'm reading the words. It's a lot like that code we had a second ago with the set. So you told me to make a map from strings to ints, and I'll call it counters or something. This is a map of counters of words or something. And so you're saying here, I just read a word, and now I got to sort of put it in the map. So I think the idea is, like if, the, if you haven't thought about this kind of problem before, if the map is empty and I see the word high, then what I need to do is I need to make the map store, you know, high is associated with one, right? You get that? And now if I read the next word and the next word is okay, then I need the map to store, you know, high has a count of one and okay has a count of one. You know, I need to be storing these pairs, right? But if I see a word again, like I see high another time, then instead of a third pair in the map, I want to store high with with two, do you understand? So accumulate the counter if there is one, make a new counter if there isn't one. So um, there is a method called contains key, oh, do I not have, I didn't import the map.h uh, include map.h, that's fine. Um, so if I contain, if I don't contain a key for this word, I've never seen this word before, so that's more like this situation here, right? So what I should do is I should say, hey, counters, I want to put a new pair in you that's this word with a count of one. Okay? But if I have seen the word before, I want to get the count for this word, int count equals, and then I want to do counters dot put this word count plus one, like that. So go get the old count, put it back in with one more than that. So now, uh, I see your question, I'll take you in just a second. So now, once I finish reading the file, I want to ask the user for a word, they tell me a word, and I'll look up how many times that word occurs. So to look up the count of a word, it's not zero, it's counters.get that word, right? Right, so it's fairly straightforward. We even usually do an example kind of like this in 106A, so I'm going a little fast. But if I run, uh-oh, undefined reference to main, oh, it's, I think I called it main map, because if you have two mains, it gets confused. So, okay, main run uh, readingbible.txt. So that finished fairly quickly. You saw it took about a second or two. Word to search for God. <laughs> Jesus. 
uh, devil, the, I don't know if that's correct, but it looks like it's working. Uh, funny story, at one quarter I wrote this program, and I thought I was reading from the Bible, but I was actually reading from the book Moby Dick. And I was typing like God and devil, and it was like two, one occurrences. And I'm like, I thought God got mentioned more than a couple of times in there. This is weird. I don't know. Maybe this is some kind of new hipster version of the Bible where they call him the big G or something. I don't know. But, uh, so this is mostly working. I want to point out there's a small, you might have been raising your hand about this. Uh, there is a small change you could make to this code. Um, one cool thing about our map structure is that if you try to go get a pair and there isn't a pair for that word, it will return some default zero-y kind of a value. And so you actually could just delete everything up, everything highlighted you could delete. You could just say, go get the counter. If there isn't one, it'll give you a zero. Put it back in with a zero plus one. So I could do that. And the other thing is, you know, instead of, oops, where was I? Instead of saying dot get, you can say bracket word, right? And instead of put word, you can say bracket word equals count plus. So you could, that's a little cleaner, right? So actually I could, instead of that, I could cut this and I could paste that. So now I'm down to one line. So actually, I could just write that. <laughs> so uh, the whole loop goes to that. Um, and that actually works. It'll, if there wasn't a counter, it'll add one, and it'll increase it by one. Um, now, that's a little bit of a specific thing about our library. So this longer version is fine, too. But um, you know, the short version is cool. So yeah. Questions about this example? You might have seen one like this before. I just wanted to show you how to do it with our library. Yeah. change the default? I don't think you can. That's a nice idea. Maybe someday we should add that to our library. But for now, the default is kind of the zero equivalent of that type. If it's a string, it would be an empty string. If it's a double, it would be 0, 0.0, something like that. Um, I want to do one more example with you. I don't think I quite have enough time, but maybe we can kind of 106x our way out of this. Um, I want to talk about anagrams. So anagrams, you know, you rearrange a word, right? So wait, let me jump to, I have a slide on this. So, here, imagine you know, I've got a file full of words, dictionary of words. I want to be able to type in a word and then print out all the words that are anagrams of it. So how do you do it? Well, I can read in my file full of words, and then somehow I need to figure out which ones have the same letters as each other, right? Well, I'll give you a hint. You could take the letters of a word and you could sort them by alphabetical order. And what do you notice about that? If you sort two words and they have the same sorted result, those two words are anagrams of each other, right? OK, and let's pretend that I'm so nice I wrote you a sort letters function that takes a string and returns a sorted version of that string. So if you have that wonderful tool, how could I figure out the anagrams of a word? It's going to involve a map. What would the map store? Any ideas? Hmm? Could you map from sorted words to like a lexicon of like words that sort that? Yeah, I think you've got really pretty much the right idea. Like maps sort of maps are about looking up. I have this and I want that, right? I have this and I want these, right? So the map should maybe have strings as the keys and a group of all the anagrams of that string as the values. Now, you gave me a couple important tweaks on that. You said, don't make this guy be the key. Make the sorted version of this guy be the key. Because then all of these guys have the same key, and they all map to that set of, of words as the value. I think that's kind of the right idea. Um, if I go to my anagram file here, um, I'm reading words. I want to make a map from strings, which are like these sorted words, to, let's say, sets of other strings that are anagrams of that string. Do you understand? So now here, if you read a word, I could do string sorted equals sort letters of that word. I think I need to do, uh, 
trim word. There's a trim to strip the white space off. But OK, so now I've got the sorted version. Like, you know, hello becomes E H L L O or something like that, right? I want to put it into this map. Basically, I want to go to anagrams of sorted. That is a set of strings. I want to add this word to that set. Okay? Down here, you type a word. You ask the user to type a word. I will get the sorted form of that word. And then I will look up anagrams for that sorted word. Compile. Oh, wait, I don't. This isn't main. Hang on. This is called mainagram. Uh, maps. Oh, I have to turn off the main in the other file. I know it's time to go. Uh, ready for this? Anagrams of sacred. <laughs> it's got a bunch of slash R's on it. Whatever, you get the idea. It's got all the anagrams of that word stored as a set. So that's, that's an example of a map of sets. I have to go in a second, but I'll take a couple questions. Yeah. Why did I use a map instead of a hash map? That's a great idea. I think a hash map would actually have been better because I don't care about the order. I might care about the order in which the anagrams themselves print. So maybe this should be a set instead of a hash set. But this overall map is better as a hash map. I agree with you on that. Is that your question too? Okay, well, I'm out of time. Have a wonderful weekend. I'll see you on Monday. Thanks a lot.